everybody doing this morning? All right, well, stand with us. We're going to go to the Lord and worship. It's a new song. Pick it up. I'm coming with the heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking through the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. much more. We're looking to a new horizon. We're praying for your rain to pour. An overflowing of new redemption. An overflowing of your kingdom.
let's offer up the sacrifice. Let's ingest the sacrifice. Let's put the sacrifice into the temple. <laughs> sacrifice of communion. The body and blood of Jesus. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you remember me. You place the sacrifice within the temple. So let's, we're going to do that right now. Uh, we're going to take communion off to my left, off to your right is the table where the uh, has been tore apart, broken for you and me. We encourage you to take from that bread, grab a piece. It's all one loaf because we're all eating from the same bread, no matter what your background is. It's the same sacrifice that we're all putting faith in. The same sacrifice that we're relying on sacrifice of Jesus. Grab a cup of juice that represents the blood of the new covenant, the blood of Christ that has been poured out for us, for our forgiveness, for our salvation. Take that off to a place that you'd like to, just up to the front here, back to your seat, gather around with your family or, or with others. Let's pray over it together and let's receive this sacrifice been poured out for us. So Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you and thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, for his body and for his blood that was given for us, the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundations of the world. We can now look back on the old rugged cross and see the altar that the Lamb was crucified on for us and for our sins. We confess our sins to you, Father. We confess a need for a Savior. The Spirit never just fills a temple. It's only after the sacrifice has been placed on the altar. And it's a pleasing sacrifice to Him. And he accepts it when his glory fills our temple. Not because of our own goodness or our own righteousness, but because of the blood and the body of the Lamb of God. So we thankfully lift up this sacrifice. It was for us, for our sins, and for our salvation that he was crucified. So we remember him today. We celebrate him today. Who made a way, who opened up the door for us to be called children of God. We bless this bread today and this juice that it'll be for us a, a bridge to connect with the body and blood of Jesus himself.
about of worship there's a scripture that says that our obedience is worship so I don't I don't know about you guys <laughs> some of that's been tough here lately for me so as we were singing that I just kept hearing I'm coming back to the heart of obedience I'm coming back to the heart of submission because it's all about you I don't belong to myself I am not my own. So forgive me, Lord, because that's what I tried to make it. I've tried to be my own. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. Me, the cross before me, the world behind me. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. You can take this whole world, but give me Jesus. We'll take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. I won't turn back, I won't look back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I Follow, though none go with me, still I will follow. I won't turn back, I won't turn back, because I have this 
decided I have decided to follow Jesus well, I have decided to follow Jesus I made up my mind decided to follow Jesus no turning back You may be seated. How many of you decided to follow Jesus? Nice, nice. Welcome in, everybody. We're glad that you have joined us for worship today. And thank you, worship team, for... Somebody's continuing the worship. They're just like, you know what? I got a phone. It's all good. I'll just got YouTube. I got a phone. I'm going to rock it out back there. Um, yeah, if you play an instrument other than a phone, please see me after service. We'd like for you to join our worship team. If you play a phone, then cool. That's, that's lovely. It's good for you and Jesus. Um, but no, we're glad that you're here with us today. If you're new to City Chapel, welcome in. Um, there's a card at the seat where you sat down or somewhere near you. If you would take out that connection card and fill that out, you can drop it off in the red uh, boxes that are on the wall there. Or you can scan the QR code and uh, fill out the connection card that way. We'd love to hear from you and connect with you if you're watching from home or from the road in your car, uh, welcome in. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, citychapelchurch.com, or just leave a comment on Facebook. Uh, Carol will reach out to you there. And um, yeah, we want to connect with you and see how we can uh, pray with you and see how we can get you connected into Christian community. Let's take a moment just to give financially to the Lord. Also, there's a card there that says it's a giving card. Uh, oh, I got the wrong one. I showed, out the, I showed up the other one. So this is the giving card, wrong color. So the, the cream one is the giving card. And if you'd take that for just a minute and scan the QR code there and or text any amount to 84321. Uh, if you're watching from home, that's the best way uh, for you to give. But if you're here in the room, you can also drop off a check or cash in the red boxes. That is perfectly acceptable as well. Let's dismiss our 12 and 13-year-olds. If you are 12 or 13 years old, we have a special class for you. Miss Jalisha is in the back, and um, she's ready to take you to that class. Uh, a special, we have a special, uh, a couple special guests today that I'm going to let them share at the end of service so that, uh, so that you guys can pay attention, stay awake the entire time. And then uh, we got um, uh, Dayton and Christian that are going to share with us today. And uh, yeah, excited about them and stuff that's going on in their life, stuff God's doing in their life. But um, first, let's jump into Mark chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. Otherwise, it'll be on the screen. We're going to continue in a story that uh, we started a couple of weeks ago. We're walking verse by verse through the gospel of Mark, and we are on chapter 5. A couple of weeks ago, we started here in the beginning of chapter 5, so we're going to continue along that story. And then we took a break last week for Mother's Day, and didn't Roe do a great job of sharing the word on Mother's Day? Um, I finally, I finally got her to to get up and preach. Um, she's 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 been preaching like almost as long as I have. I think she was preaching long before we ever met and um, teaching the word, and that's her passion. And so, yeah, we might. I don't know, but we might have to get her up here a little more often. We might have to just pressure. Send, send some pressure that way to encourage her to get up and share more often. But um, for me, I'm here in Mark chapter 5, and we're going to continue the story that we left off where Jesus healed the man who was possessed by demons. Um, and that's a powerful story, and, uh, but it's not over yet. Uh, this particular story carries on. It's interesting that, that, that Mark carries on this story and lets us know what happens after the miracle. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Mark chapter 5, and we're going to back it up a little bit and look um, at verse 10, when Jesus is about to cast the demons out of the man. Um, it says that uh, the demons begged him earnestly that they would not, that he would not send them out of the country. 
Now that's important. I don't know if you know it or not, but demons are territorial. And they're territorial because they've been given authority in a particular place based off of the people who live there. So the country here that he's talking about is what is known as what was known as Decapolis or Decapolis. It means ten cities. These ten cities were mostly uh, pagans. They were not Jewish people, and uh, they were around Israel though. And there was this kind of unique situation where Rome um, granted auto almost almost complete autonomy to these ten cities. In fact, in their ancient coins, they they have words like um, free and sovereign and sacred with regard to their particular countries. It was 10 uh, cities that all formed sort of a coalition called the Decapolis or the 10 cities. And they basically were a lot like Rome already. So they already had established a, sort of the a pantheon of gods that they worshiped. Most of them had a huge uh, uh, temple to Zeus. Uh, that they had adopted from the Greeks who, was, who were ruling over them prior to the Romans. And about 60 years before Jesus was born, these 10 cities were granted by the Romans sort of a bit of autonomy. Unlike Israel, by the way, Israel, uh, Rome had a pretty strong thumb on top of them. Uh, they appointed a guy named Herod who would kind of be their representative and rule over them. And so Herod got to choose who the high priest was. Which is why when they wanted to uh, condemn Jesus, they, they met in the middle of the night because they wanted to meet with the real high priest, not Herod's high priest. So there's a lot of things in the Gospels that you begin to understand when you understand the geopolitical stuff that's happening in the region. Basically, Rome was like, we don't trust you Jews. You guys believe in one God. You're a little bit radical, a little bit weird. We're going to definitely be in charge of you. But these other 10 cities, they're kind of going along with the way we do things. And so they were given quite a bit of freedom. And this is where Jesus is. He is in the land of the Gadarenes. If you look at the beginning of chapter, uh, Mark chapter 5, it says that Jesus sailed in a boat to, to the land of the Gadarenes. That, that means the land of the people from Gadara, which is one of the ten cities in Decapolis. Okay, so, so this, this is what the demons are saying. They're saying, don't send us out of this region. Now, obviously, Jesus can do whatever he wants. But they recognize that they have authority in that region. They've been given authority. They're really saying, Jesus, could you please play by the rules and let us stick around in the place where we have been given authority? Because this is our town. This is our place. Actually, this is the only time that I'm aware that Jesus goes to a non-Israeli location. Jesus did not go to Rome. He didn't go to the places where the early church went. He said, I'm called to the Jews first. And that's where he went. So oftentimes, almost every single time you see Jesus do a miracle, it is among Jewish people, among people who believe in Yahweh, believe in Jehovah. But this particular time, Jesus sails outside of Jewish territory and lands in this particular country. Why am I saying that? Well, it's going to be important for you to understand the people's response. Because their response is, is based on where they're coming from. All of our responses are based on our perspectives. And so Jesus goes to this place where they don't believe in Yahweh. They don't believe in Jehovah. They have active uh, temples built to Zeus. They have active, actually each one had an active sort of outdoor pavilion built to the Roman emperor, who they also believed was God. So you could worship the Roman emperor in each of the ten cities of Decapolis. They had a pantheon, all kinds of gods. Jesus shows up there, and the demons say, look, we, we belong here. Don't send us out of the country. So in verse 11, Jesus permits that. Jesus says, yeah, you're, you're right. There is a legal right that you have to stay here. So in verse 7, there was a large herd of swine that was feeding near the mountains. This is a mountainous region. If you look at the Sea of Galilee, it's really kind of like a big lake. You can see from one side to the other, and it's kind of like a bowl. There's mountains all around it. And so there's a, there's a mountain maybe two, maybe 300 yards away. There's a herd of swine feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once, Jesus gave them permission then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. Mark gives us the, the number, which is interesting. He could have just said there's a lot of swine, but he wants us to know just how many were talking. About 2,000 pigs. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine 
Now, we didn't even know there were people feeding the swine until this part of the story. The entire story is focused in a desolate place where Jesus and his disciples encounter a crazy guy who's possessed by roughly 2,000 demons. And, and, and that's all we know. And now we find out that it's not just them. There's this other group of people a couple hundred yards away feeding pigs. Now those people become integral into the story. The ones who fed the swine fled. To flee means to run away in terror. They were freaked out. And they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. See, they didn't even really know what happened. All they knew was their perspective. And so their perspective was from that of the people who were feeding the pigs. Okay? And then they go out into the city, into the country. They, they become evangelists, evangelists, plural, for this miracle. And then they bring a bunch of people back and they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And this next sentence has always boggled me. And they were afraid. They weren't afraid when the guy was crazy. <laughs> they were used to that. There's things that we get used to and we learn to be unafraid of things we ought to be afraid of. But when it shifts, when the paradigms shift, we become afraid of what we actually ought to welcome. And so they saw the man sitting in his right mind and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it had happened. I guess these are the disciples. And who, uh, the, uh, how it had happened to the one who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. The very next verse we see in verse 18 that Jesus gets into the boat and he leaves. And I want to cover that here in a minute. But first, really, this is where I want to focus my attention today. I feel like God has some things for us to learn and to apply to our lives from the aftermath of the miracle. So, so really, I want to talk to you not so much about the miracle, but I want to talk to you about the mess after the miracle. Because almost any time that God does a miracle in your life, there's going to be some mess afterward. There's always some kind of aftermath. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill said in Why, Revi Why Revival Terries, he said that whenever God smiles, the enemy frowns. <laughs> so if God is doing anything in your life at all, if there's any presence of Jesus, if there's any activity, spiritual activity in your life for the better, the enemy is going to come right alongside that and bring some opposition to that. We actually, we, we saw this uh, when, 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 two weeks ago when I taught on the first part of this where Jesus cast out demons, right? And so that very next Wednesday night, we were teaching on spiritual warfare. And so we had a pretty good crowd come out to learn about spiritual warfare. That Wednesday night after the class, immediately people who were in the class started getting spiritually attacked because they were in a spiritual warfare class. And within the next 24 hours, I think it was like five or six different people messaged me or talked to me or called me and said, this crazy thing happened, this crazy thing happened, this crazy thing. There was all this crazy stuff that was going on. And for me, I guess I've been walking with Jesus long enough to be kind of encouraged by that. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Harry, yeah, that's weird. You're weird. Something's wrong with you. No, I just, I just understand that when you're doing something right, the enemy is going to come against you. There's going to be a mess. There's going to be a mess after the miracle. And I love that Mark included the mess after the miracle because we don't know how many miracles are in the Gospels that the writer just skipped on to the next good thing and forgot to tell us about the mess. In other words, Mark is a pastor. He's writing this gospel as a pastoral gospel. He's interested not just in teaching us who Jesus is and what Jesus did. He's also interested in helping us have the right response to him. And I love that because that's also my job as a pastor. My job is not just simply to stand up every Sunday and meet with you privately and tell you who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. That's part of it. But the other part is to help you understand how you can respond to who Jesus is and what he has done. And so Mark gives us an example of how not to respond. <laughs> really, he's giving us an example of what happens when the guys who feed the pigs deliver the message. He's given us an example of what happens. 
when the guys who feed the pigs deliver the message. So in order to understand that, you have to understand the story from their perspective. So in order to understand that, let me just tell you a little, little story about guys who p- feed pigs. All right. Now, nowadays, it's a little bit different. It's specific farmers. But back in the day, honestly, guys who would feed the pigs, they would, they would be the trash collectors of their day. So, like, nowadays, we have trash, like, cardboard boxes from Amazon. We got styrofoam cups. We got plastic. We got things going out. But back in the day, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have that stuff going out to trash. Nobody was getting cardboard boxes from Amazon, for instance. Nobody was using uh, cardboard, uh, plastic plates or styrofoam cups or anything like that. They weren't running out of batteries in their, in, their, uh, in their devices, right? They weren't throwing that kind of stuff away. So most of the trash that you would have on a daily or weekly basis was organic trash. It was food. It was compost. It was uh, leftover banana peels or bits of carcasses of meat that you didn't eat or, you know, rinds from the uh, uh, watermelon that you didn't feed. And all of that stuff would be brought out and people, people who fed pigs would go collect that stuff. The Nazis actually reincorporated this whole idea. They, they, had, a, they had a plan back in the 1930s to, to help the farmers for free by collecting compost from, from, from the city. So they would drive around, collect the compost, drop it off to farmers to feed the pigs. For thousands of years, people have been doing this. Nowadays, we just throw it into landfills. And, and Anyway, but back in the day, they would utilize this stuff because this is the stuff, the slop that pigs eat. Pigs basically eat trash. So if you're talking 2,000 pigs, I mean, the smell. I don't know if you've ever driven by like a pig farm, but I mean, the smell would have been just awful. Like Jesus could have smelled the pigs from 300 yards away. You know what I'm saying? 2,000 of them. We're talking there's so much poop and filth and nastiness, and your job is to go through the town, collect stuff that also smells horrible. Collect stuff that's also basically trash. Shovel, you, you got a horse, you got a little buggy cart thingy, you shovel it into the cart, and then you take it out away from the city because that's where they want the pigs <laughs> so that the smell doesn't like waft into the, And so then you take it out there where nobody else wants to go except you and crazy guy, crazy Bob, let's call him. So you and Crazy Bob, he's out there. He's learned to kind of respect you, and he doesn't mess with you anymore. You got a few guys. You got some shovels. You're out there shoveling, you know, poop and trash and shoveling out into the the area, and all the pigs start gathering around you, 2,000. Like, and these things are not little. This isn't like Wilbur from Charlotte's Web, okay? This is, like, these are like 200, 300 pound beasts. These are animals, man. These things, like, and they're oinking or whatever. I don't know what sound they're making. Like, they're all just kind of like, I don't know if you ever fed animals, but when the food cart comes by, you become super popular. <laughs> and you get, and if you don't like animals, that's a scary thing. You get start getting surrounded. Like, if you ever walk into a cow pasture, I walked into a cow pasture one time with, uh, uh, with uh, Pastor Robin's dad, and he had a feed thing. And they, all these massive, I mean, like 1,500 pound animals are like gathering around you, and they're hungry, you know? And, and so that's, that's the vibe. These guys are used to it, though. This is, this is, I don't know, Tuesday morning. They're out there shoveling. They're just doing their thing. And they notice on the Sea of Galilee, there's this boat of 13 guys that comes up to the shore near the cemetery near crazy bob's place and they say oh jerry check this out look we got some new ones we got some friends these guys don't know this is a bad place for a picnic and suddenly crazy bob just screams and he's yelling he's naked right he's been cutting himself he's crazy bob I don't know why I chose Bob, but Bob's just a funny name for a crazy guy, I guess. And so crazy Bob just starts going nuts. And you've seen him beat people up before. I mean, this is not going to go good. Those guys better hurry up and get back in that boat because they're in trouble. Crazy Bob's coming. Crazy naked Bob is running after them yelling. And suddenly he just falls flat on his face in front of what looks like the main guy. The only guy who actually slept that night. (laughs) from the previous story. Uh, the, like, he falls in front of Jesus. You don't know it's Jesus. You just know it's like the main guy who got out of the boat. And Bob just, boom, he's down. And it's like, did he die? Did they, did they, boom, you know, a little blow dart on Bob? Are they like, he's like, a, like Navy SEALs or something? What's going on? And Bob's just out. He's just laying there silent. He's not like, and then it's like, well, maybe that guy's talking to Bob. It looks like maybe they're talking. Oh, okay, maybe he knows them. Maybe Bob knows him from way back. Maybe he's crazy too. Like, I don't know what's going on. And they're talking, and then you see the main guy, like, point over at you. 
And you're like, oh, hey, how's it going? (laughs) Right about then, one of the pigs that you're feeding just bites your ankle. They don't have sharp teeth, but they, they are pretty powerful. Like, hogs are pretty powerful. He, like, bites your ankle. You're like, what in the world? He's foaming at the mouth. His eyes look pretty crazy, and he starts jumping around like 300 pounds. He's pulling on your leg, and suddenly all 2,000 pigs become demon-possessed. This is stuff from, like, a horror movie. Like, can you imagine being surrounded by 2,000 demon-possessed pigs? And they're hungry. And they're like chomping away. And you get up on the cart, the cart's shaking. I don't know if they killed the horses, but they could easily trample horses. They could easily push over all your carts and trample you. And they're doing things you've never seen pigs do before. They're jumping and flipping, like 300 pounds flopping over you. And it's getting really weird. I mean, being surrounded, like what, what was that? There's, there's, there's some movie out, I haven't seen it, but it's like a doll that gets possessed, I think, by a demon. And she basically wreaks havoc on the whole town. Like this little girl doll, I forget what it's called. Like that's just one doll. We're talking 2,300 pound animals suddenly got totally possessed by demonic powers. This is scary stuff. These guys are shocked. These guys are like, I don't don't know who that guy is. He's like the leader of demons. Like what in the world is going on? And and they're, they're fighting for their lives at this point. But then the pigs start turning on each other. And they start chewing on each other and biting flesh. And it says they ran violently down the hill. Not quickly, violently. Are they pulling out each other's eyeballs? Are they flipping on top of it and beating at each other? Because that's kind of what demons do, right? They're so full of hate, so full of anger. And they're just bashing and they're pushing each other toward the water until finally they fall, all of them fall off a cliff. And then it gets real quiet. And the guys look over and there's 2,000 bodies bubbling, fat little bellies bobbing on the water. That's all they know. And they're like, well, I'm getting out of here. And they flee the scene. They run and they tell it to the city. So what the Lord was showing me this week is that it's not that the miracle scared people. The miracle wasn't the problem. It was the message that was relayed to the people that caused them to reject Jesus. And so what's that message? Well, as best I can tell, the message is twofold. Number one, it's a message of loss. And number two, it's a message of fear. I think these are the main things. If I was a feeder of the pigs, and I just experienced something like that, and I knew exactly what I know, which isn't much, my message would be a message of loss and a message of fear. Message of loss, first off, is a message that we just lost 2,000 pigs. (laughs) <laughs> which is a big loss. 2,000 pigs. I, I don't know how much pigs cost back in the day, but I did a Google search about how much they cost now. And if you want to buy a pig to raise, like the kind of pig that you want to raise, if you want to buy a hog, they start at $500 each. Now, they go up to, according to Google, $2,000 each based on the genetics and the type of pig that it is. I have no idea what type of genetics make for a more expensive pig. I have zero clue. But I know that it's somewhere between the range of $500 and $2,000 per pig. Now, you multiply that by $2,000. That means in a single morning, these boys lost $1 million to $4 million in today's economy. That's a huge loss. That's a massive loss, especially when you consider that the town that these guys are in was probably about 75, 50 to 100 people. It's not a large town. It's about the size of the amount of people that come to City Chapel on Sunday in person. It's like 100 people. And those 100 people, you say, well, what do they need 2,000 pigs for? Obviously, they don't need the 2,000 pigs. Obviously, they sell the pigs to all those around because even 2,000 years ago, bacon was was a thing (laughs) and so so obviously this is a major part of the town's business like 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 if all of city chapel came together we pulled all of our resources we might have four million bucks maybe if we all came together uh we pull in all our resources we give all of our houses all of our land all of our vehicles okay cool maybe that's around four or five maybe eight million i don't know Uh, but but it's, it's 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 all that we got and then in one morning you lose somewhere between one and four million dollars 
And as I was thinking about that, I, was, I, I, I told Ro, I said, babe, can you imagine if every time somebody got saved at City Chapel or delivered or healed, God worked out a deal with the devil where like the families of City Chapel lost like just, half, just $2 million. So maybe like six families, would, you, you lose your homes and you lose all of your cars. How quickly would you ask Jesus to leave? How long would it take for you to say, ah, <laughs> the church down the road is looking pretty good. I think, I think the Lord's calling me on, Pastor Harry. I just saw these five families lose their homes. I saw the Fleming family lose their farm. The deed was instantly in someone else's name, and they're homeless now, and they don't have any vehicles. That's just one guy. Crazy Bob, downtown Austin, gets saved. And $4 million is zapped out of an economy. And it's easy for us to sit back and judge them and be like, oh, you people, I can't believe you rejected Jesus. How much has Jesus cost you? Because the truth, like, this is the thing. It is, in fact, costly to follow Jesus. The miraculous will cost you and me. Anytime you see a move of God, anytime you see anyone who has any anointing or any understanding of the word of God, you can be sure they have paid a high price for that. Just because you haven't seen the price doesn't mean they haven't paid it. Anytime, anytime somebody gets saved, somebody has paid a price. Now, Jesus paid the price with his blood, absolutely. But in order to get that message, the cost of the message from where it started to where it is today has cost much more than $4 million. And these people, like it's true that there is a cost to following Jesus. It's absolutely true. But the, 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 the problem with the message is that that is the only thing that they heard about. They didn't know about the miracle. The guys who fed the pigs didn't know about the benefits. They just knew about the cost. And what I've found is that this, this is a real key to after you've experienced something in God, after you've experienced some revelation or after God has done something in your life, it's important that while you recognize and consider the cost, you don't focus on the cost. The cost cannot be the primary message that you tell yourself. I remember one time I was, I was, in, a, I was in the driveway of, uh, we were back, back when, we, when we had our office in Buda. We had a city chapel office in da downtown Buda, and we were, we'd have like small group meetings and stuff. And, and after one of the meetings, there was a lady, and her and her husband had been making strides with God. They had been changing their life around, and they had been seeing some good things, but there was a cost. And she was out in the parking lot telling me all about the cost and all about the cost and all about the cost. And she lost these friends and she's the, the enemy's been attacking her health and her car broke down and, da, 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 and all the cost. And that's fine. Like, it's true. I, you want to talk about, I'll tell you what I've paid. <laughs> like, let's, let's talk about what we've lost. Let's talk about what it's cost us. Fine. I can, I can get with that. But what I can't get with is stopping the conversation there. Because if all I did was sit around and think about what this journey has cost me, I would end up leaving this journey. But the truth is, it hasn't just cost me. I have received a lot of benefits from this, right? Psalm 103, David said, uh, bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all of his benefits. Because it's very easy when you're faced with the cost to then forget about the benefits. To then be like, man, yeah, why am I following God at all? And so, so be careful what message you're sending yourself. Be careful what messages you're sending yourself over and over and over again because those messages will determine how you live. Paul, for instance, said, look, we are, we are pressed but not crushed. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are crushed down almost to the breaking point, but yet God is with us. And this is why we don't give, why we don't lose heart. We don't give up because we remember there's a cost, but there's also a huge benefit. We don't give up because we, we, the message that comes from the, the mess cannot get louder than the message that comes from the miracle. You cannot let the, 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 the messengers to, that are there to tell you about how much it's cost you to outweigh the message of what God has done for you. Psalm 103, I think we have that actually. And you can read that along with us. It's that's Mark. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And these are some of his benefits. He makes sure your car never breaks down. Oh, 
no, wait a minute. Oh, no. No, that's not. Oh, why? Right, because that's temporary. Because people that are miserable have really nice cars. That's what, because that's not a benefit. <laughs> the niceness of your car, the niceness of your house is not one of the benefits you should be counting. Because these are all passing away. They're all dying. They're all falling apart. People who are killing themselves, literally depressed, are driving very nice cars. Why? Because that's not happiness. That's not a benefit. Here's a benefit. He forgives all of my iniquities. Buddha can't do that. Hinduism cannot deal with your past iniquities. It can teach you some seven pillars to do things a little bit better next time, but it cannot deal with what you have done. Where do you go when you are overwhelmed with the weight of what you have done? I go to Jesus. He forgives all of my past iniquities. He cleanses my past. He removes them from me as far away as the east is from the west. And that's a benefit. And does it cost me financially? Absolutely. Does it cost me emotionally? Absolutely. Have I had to pay a price? Have I had to turn down some opportunities, some relationships? Absolutely. But I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today because far better than all of that is that my sins have been forgiven far better than all of that is I stand redeemed and that my past doesn't count against me <laughs> he says look forget not all his benefits here's a list he forgives all your iniquities and he heals all of your diseases how's he gonna heal it if you don't catch it We feel like a benefit is if I never get a disease. Well, that's the benefit. God's going to shelter me and shield me from, from never catching any disease. No, 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 no. You're actually going to get diseases because he is going to heal your diseases. <laughs> now, he may not heal them in your timing. He may not heal them in your way that you want him to, but he heals all of our diseases. He doesn't shelter us from diseases, but within our sickness, we find a healer. He heals all of our diseases, and he redeems our life from destruction, which means you have to get close to destruction for him to redeem your life from destruction. I'm just saying that there's always going to be a mess with every miracle, but the message that comes out of the mess has to emphasize the miracle and not the mess. Otherwise, you will give up. You will lose heart. You'll quit. And you'll say, you know what, it's just too hard. Because the message that's playing in your mind, it, it, it causes these people that when they see Jesus, and this, and this is what I've found, man. I've found that honestly some people, and myself included, sometimes I don't want victory as much as I want tranquility. I'd rather not get sick at all than to get sick and have Jesus heal my diseases. I'd rather him maintain my comfort than build up my testimony. But man, when you ask God to save you from your testimony, when you ask God to save your kids from their testimony, what you're doing is you're robbing the message that God wants to bring out of this. And so often we, we get confused. We feel like tranquility is peace. No, no, no. The absence of, of conflict, that's not peace. Peace is the presence of God, even in the, even in the middle of conflict. I think, I think it was, that's what Paul said, even in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all of these things, it says in Romans, in the midst of all of these things, we are more than conquerors. And so what I get fired up about is the victory stories that come out of the opposition. But so many people just, they get discouraged by the opposition. They, they, they want to quit because of the opposition. And you might just need to, I don't know, see, it, see, the, see the miracle the way that the man who had been delivered by the demon saw it. Jesus tells the man, uh, and actually we can go to that verse real quick. In verse 18... Jesus uh, tells the man, the man wants to go with Jesus. 
It's so interesting, man. On the one hand, his fellow countrymen want Jesus out of their lives. The man wants to completely change his life to be with Jesus. That's the difference between what you're focusing on. He's a part of the same economy, by the way. He's a part of the same situation. And yet he wants to go with Jesus. The others want Jesus to go away. And so in verse 19, it's Jesus doesn't let him go with him. Interesting. He let the demons go in the pigs, but he won't let the guy go in the boat. <laughs> Instead, he said, go home to your friends and tell them, uh, New King James says, what great things the Lord has done for you. Notice he gives them a twofold message. First off, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. The word great things, it actually means the great number of things. It doesn't mean the greatness of the things. It means the, the plethora. All the things is what he's saying. Why? Because that is the message that will inspire faith. When you just tell people about the cost, when you just tell yourself about the cost then you start breeding doubt in your heart. But if you will talk about all the things, if you will talk about the way in which God has saved your mind, the way God has rescued your emotions, the way that God has given you peace, the way that God has forgiven your sins, the way that God has healed your diseases, the way that God has redeemed you from destruction, ultimate destruction, when you start talking about all the things, this is what Jesus said. He said, look, you don't, need to, you don't need to only talk about the good stuff. You can talk about the cost. You can, you can tell people about the pigs. In fact, Mark, be sure to keep that in, the, in that part right there. Actually, Mark wasn't in the boat. Peter was in the boat. So Jesus might have turned to Pete and said, hey, when you and Mark write that gospel, you make sure to tell them there was about eh, 2,000 pigs, I would say. Yeah, give or take. Baptist numbers. There was 2,000 pigs, and we're just going to go with that. Right? And, and so he, he's like, no, we want to include the cost. But the cost cannot be the primary message. Because if the cost is the primary message, people will reject Jesus. So he says, look, son, go tell him all the stuff. Because you're the only one that knows all the stuff. Those, those guys feeding the pigs, all they know is what they lost. They haven't actually experienced the life change that happened to you. So if you've experienced life change, I want you to go tell them all the stuff. Tell them about the cost. Tell them about the freedom. Tell them about all the stuff. And so this is, this, is, this is the way that we counteract this message from the mess. Number one, the message from the mess tells us that the miracle is too costly. Jesus is, we're going to lose too much. It's a message of loss. But then it's a message of fear. And this is fear that we see in the face of the people who find Jesus and the man sitting there. And uh, that's always confused me. Why would they be afraid? I understand about the loss, but why are they afraid of this? And I was talking to uh, Rocky this week, and I asked him, I said, do you, know, do you know why those people were afraid when they saw the man in his right mind? Why aren't they happy? Because they've been trying to chain him so that he wouldn't hurt himself. They've been, trying to, they've been trying to help him. Crazy Bob, uncle, crazy uncle Bob. <laughs> I've been trying to help him for years. Like, this, this should be good. They should be like, oh, well, we lost a lot of pigs, but we got Bob back. That's pretty cool. He can come to family dinners now, right? Mom, right? He can, yeah, like, Bob's back. Look, why, why, the, why are they afraid of Bob being healed. He's actually got some clothes on. That's nice for a change. <laughs> not cutting himself, not yelling. What's the deal? And, and uh, Rocky, said, Rocky said, well, I think people are afraid of what they don't understand. And I thought about that, and I think there is some truth to that. But I think in this case, I think people are more afraid of what they do understand if what they understand is different from what they believe. Meaning, for instance, if I put myself in these people's shoes and I worship Zeus because he's, he's, he's it. Like, he's all-powerful. He, nothing gets past Zeus. Zeus is, I mean, like, the guy, the stories about Zeus are pretty bizarre. He's pretty awesome. He, like, holds lightning, you know, and throws it at people. I mean, like, he's, he's powerful. He's the god of all gods. He's the one who sits on top of Olympus, and, the, and, and, and he just kind of, like, he's in charge. And if I have been bringing sacrifices to Zeus for the past 10 years, praying for Uncle Bob, 
And I've been, I've been even, even spreading around the love. I've been asking Diana as well, because she's pretty cool. She's pretty powerful. Maybe she can do something for Uncle Bob. And then I've been offering sacrifices to Caesar, because they conquered the entire world. I guess he knows what he's doing. And so he must be some kind of deity. And I've been offering all these sacrifices for all of these years. I wonder if it equaled $4 million. I'm not sure. But these people had been giving to demons, basically. That's what the worship of foreign false gods is. That's demonic worship. Statues don't want to be worshipped. No statue ever was like, yes, please bow down before me. No, it's demonic. It's demonic spirits trying to get faith from people. And it's interesting, isn't it, how a worship, like opening the door for the demonic in the middle of town caused oppression by the demonic in the outskirts of town. We, we often don't relate the two. The ways in which we open doors and the ways in which we are oppressed. I had a lady talking to me one time after service and she wanted me to come by her house and pray over her house because she'd been having some spooky, weird things going on. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to pray over your house, but let's talk about you. Because you're the one living there. So, according to the Bible, I could come in, clean the place up, bind the strong man, go out. But when I go out, seven more demons are going to come in, and you're going to be in a worse place than when you started. Because it's not about who comes into the house, it's about who lives in the house. So this is, what, this is what's important. So I said, what are you doing? Well, her and her boyfriend weren't quite married yet. They're going to get married. <laughs> but they weren't. They weren't going to. See, like... All the stuff you're going to do is cute. And we all think it's wonderful. But what are you doing right now? Because that's all the demonic cares about. They literally don't care about your good intentions. The road to hell is apparently paved with those kinds of statements. I was going to obey God. I was going to. I really was. As soon as it became convenient for me. As soon as it worked out. As soon as it, I had the time. As soon as. No, no, no. You don't understand. People will be standing in front of the judgment seat of Christ. Telling him all the stuff they were going to do. And Satan knows that. And he's like, cool. Yeah, yeah. When, whenever you get around to it. That's when you can do it. But for now, live in bondage. Just come on, stay in bondage with me for just a little while longer. And I will oppress your mind, and I will oppress your body, and I will oppress your relationships, and I'll even mess around your house because you can't stop me. Why? Because you've opened the door to the demonic through your sexual immorality. And, in your, your, and it's, not, it's not like you didn't know. It's not, and so I said, well, you're going to need to deal with the sexual immorality. She said, yeah, God's also been talking to me about smoking pot. I've been smoking pot. I said, yeah, you also know that. You're going, you're, going to need to, you're going to need to put away the weed. Well, Pastor, it sounds like works-based religion. No, 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 no. This is, this is Scripture. Submit to God, then resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But what we do is we bow before Zeus, and it's weird. They're asking Zeus to heal Bob, and Zeus is actually tormenting Bob. <laughs> You're turning to the very one that's tormenting you. It's like, it's like oh, I think we're afraid of, of battle because, you know, as soon as Pastor Harry says, well, if you go to this meeting, then you'll be spiritually attacked. Some of you are like, well, I'm never going to the, the spiritual warfare meeting then. Newsflash, if you bury your head in the sand, you are being spiritually attacked. The question is, it's, 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 it's like Ukraine. I mean, it's like, why are, why, why are they fighting? Because they're getting attacked, okay? Like, that's what they're doing. The enemy is the aggressor. He's coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if you don't stand up, he will simply steal, kill, and destroy. And so Zeus, the demonic spirit behind Zeus, is oppressing Bob. And the way to save Bob is not by trying to appease Zeus. Because Zeus wants to oppress you and Bob and every one of us. And yet we're afraid of that. And so if, we, if I would have spent decades praying for Bob and offering sacrifices, and, and then in one morning, this guy named Jesus has a conversation with Bob, and boom, bumps back. That would really challenge what I believe about Zeus. 
And I think this is where people get scared. Not that they don't understand, but, but that what they understand is so opposite of what they have believed. And their version of Zeus. See, so it's like, okay, so this guy's greater than Zeus, or this is, this is a problem. Because my version of Zeus is, Zeus is vengeful. Right? Like if you don't, if, if Zeus sh would show up on our shores and the first guy to meet him was Crazy Bob, <laughs> He's going to do more than take out our pigs. He's going to be angry at the entire city. In fact, he was angry. With the story of Zeus, he got, he got incredibly angry and just tried to, that's where he uh, gave birth to Pandora and gave her a box that she would open up Pandora's box and it would be awful and all these plagues and stuff would, because he was ticked off at humanity. Zeus is not a nice guy. And so the fear is that they're recognizing that Jesus is greater than Zeus, but they can only see Jesus through the lens of their former God. And I feel like for many of us, we have an experience with Jesus, and then we start seeing him through the lens of our former gods. And we become afraid of him. And we're like, oh man, oh, oh, we need to get him out of here. But, but, but here's the message that Jesus gives to the man. He says, look, when, when you go and tell people, first off, tell them all the things. And secondly, he says, tell, him, tell them how the Lord has had compassion on you. This is twofold message. Tell them all the stuff, and then tell them about the mercy of God. Because it is the mercy of God that is the exact opposite of the anger of Zeus. It is the compassion of God. The word compassion means to sense or to feel the misery of somebody else and to do something about it. God is not Zeus. He feels what we're going through. He feels the pain of Bob. He feels our pain, and he hasn't just, he's not just feeling it. He is ready to do something about it. He's ready to step in. And so what kind of effect did, did, did Bob's message have? I don't know why I'm calling him Bob, but it's just, he's a nameless guy, so I just had to give him a name. What kind of effect did he have? Well, we never hear about Bob again. We never hear about him. But maybe what God is doing in your life is not so that people will hear about you. But what we do see is that in Mark chapter 6, I think it's verse 52, they can put it up on the screen, verse 53, Jesus, in verse 52, Jesus says, let's go back to the, to the place where Bob, let's go back to that same place. Let's go visit Bob. <laughs> this, is, this is a chapter and a half later. It says, when they crossed over, they came to the land of Gesenaret, or it's also known as the land of the Gadarenes, or the land of Gergesa. It's part of Decapolis, which is where Bob was spreading his message. So they go back, and this is the only other time that I'm aware of that they actually go back to this place. They anchor there, verse 54, that when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran, ran through the whole surrounding region, through all of Decapolis, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick and where, wherever they heard that he was. In other words, in just a chapter and a half, the very people who were afraid of Jesus, rejecting Jesus, now see Jesus and say, hey, I got cousin Nick. Nick, Nick is sick. Let's go, let's go, get, some, let's go get Nick. Why, why are they doing that? Because somebody told them about all the things, and somebody told them about the compassion of Jesus. So what are you telling yourself? Are you telling yourself about all the things? Are you reminding yourself of the compassion of Jesus? Because if you are, as soon as something goes wrong in your life, you're going to run right to him, straight to him, because he has what you need. And yes, it's costly, but man, is it worth it. And by the way, what are you telling other people? Are you ashamed of the cost? I don't want to tell them because it might scare them away. Or are you so enamored by the benefits that you're like, yeah, 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 okay, fine. Um, I don't sleep with my girlfriend, but check this out. Okay, fine, I don't get drunk on the weekends, but check this out. I actually remember stuff. It's awesome. It's a lot of, a lot of fun stuff. 
but I, I, but I don't have to because I'm not depressed because my iniquities have been forgiven. Yeah, I don't sleep with my girlfriend, but, but God's redeemed me from the destructive lifestyle that I was living. And I was using people. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm loving people now. It's awesome. I mean, you, you can talk about the cost and it's there. It's real. But man, the benefits far outweigh the cost. And so that's what we want to do. We want to be a church that doesn't always uh, get captured in a moment. Because the miracle is not about the moment. The man had a miracle from Jesus, and he wanted that to continue. He thought, if I can just go sit with Jesus and walk around with him everywhere, it's just going to, just going to, I just want to sit here at your feet, and it's just be wonderful. And that's cool. There's a time for that. But after you've sat at his feet, and you go home, tell your family, tell your friends, get on social media, get your kids, get your wife. <laughs> get on. Get on social media. Yeah, I'm not going to finish that. Uh, and share what God has done. And so that's what, that's what we're doing. By the way, next Sunday night, we're going down to San Antonio uh, to share about all the things. The cost, but also the benefits of following Jesus. And we're going to share at um, uh, adult uh, teen, is it? Teen Challenge, but it's Adult and Teen Challenge. Okay, I get, I get confused. Okay, so it's Adult and Teen Challenge, and uh, if you want to come with us, we're going to lead in some worship in, in their chapel on Sunday night, 6.30 in San Antonio. Romeo is going to bring a word. Um, we're going to pray over people, and we're going to share about all the things and about the mercy of God. That's, that's, that's what we're going to do. And um, we believe in doing that in all ways, in all times, and I think this fits in really well with what Christian and Dayton are doing. Um, they're 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 going to share with you about ways in which they God's calling them to share about all the things and about the mercy of God and ways that we can support them. So, uh, would you give it up, give a round of applause for Christian and Dayton? You guys come down and share. I can use this mic. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning, church. How y'all doing? Doing good. Wow. I'm so grateful to be back here today, especially with my beautiful fiance here. <laughs> uh, for those of y'all who don't know me, my name is Christian Jones, and this is Dayton Duffy. Uh, and yeah, and we're so grateful to have the opportunity to tell you about what the Lord's doing in our lives, both for our upcoming marriage, but as well as what he's do, uh, calling us to in ministry. Um, yeah, so as y'all might have seen on y'all's flyers, there's some flyers on y'all's chairs, uh, we are in the process of becoming campus missionaries. Um, this summer, uh, in July, we are going to be entering a CMIT program, which stands for Campus Missionary and Training. Um, and yeah, we just want to speak to you guys today about our hearts and visions for these young students on the college campus. We believe that the college campus is one of the greatest opportunities available to us in order to reach the young adults who attend these universities and bring them into a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the campus ministry that we're part of is called Chi Alpha and my beautiful fiance is going to tell you a little bit about that. So here you go. Yeah, so Chi Alpha, um, when I got invited to this campus ministry, it was a girl in one of my education classes, and she said, hey, do you want to come with me to Chi Alpha? Or, and I was like, Chi Alpha, is that like a sorority? Like, I'm not going to, I don't want to join the Greek life. And I, I, I didn't know what it was, and I found out soon enough that Chi Alpha stands for Christ Ambassadors, and it's actually from Scripture. It's from 2 Corinthians 5.20, and it says... Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so um, that's what we're all about in Chi Alpha is really just reconciling students back to a relationship with the Lord, no matter where they're at in their walk with Christ. So when I came to, what, the one we're involved in is at Texas State University. And when I transferred to Texas State, I didn't know that I could have a relationship with Jesus. I kind of went to church sometimes every so often but I didn't know that Jesus 
he loved me. He had a purpose for my life. Like, it was deeper than anything I ever knew. And so just being met with love and accountability through Chi Alpha, I was able to grow in my relationship with the Lord. And that has inspired me to just continue to do that for the thousands of students that are coming through the college campus. And so uh, that's why we have a heart for the campus is to see lives transformed because I'm sure y'all know the college campus is a place, like Pastor Harry was saying in the message, there's so many perspectives, there's so many messages being told, and there's so many your truth and your truth and your truth, but we know the one truth, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and to be a light on the campus, that's the heart we have for students, to show them, like, you have a Savior who loves you and has a purpose for you. So that's what we love, Chi Alpha, and we want to continue ministering to young adults. Um, and I think Christian wants to tell you about a really special guy. Yeah, yeah so that's our heart. Uh, and I've had the opportunity uh, and the privilege to uh, be on the campus uh, with Chi Alpha and minister to young adults. Uh, I've been a part of a small group for the past year. I've been uh, leading that with my co-leader. And one of our guys, his name is Nick Lai. We have a little picture of him. A little bit blurry, but mm -hmm. our bad. <laughs> But yeah, he came to us not knowing the Lord at all. Um, he came from a place that was broken uh, and hurting. And uh, he saw one of his good friends from high school. He went off to college. He's a year older than him. And he got plugged into his uh, Chi Alpha ministry at the campus that he was going to in Shriner. And once he got plugged into their community, he had an um, encounter with Jesus. And he was radically changed. And that change, uh, Nikolai took notice of. And he asked him, like, man, what's what's new man what's what's this change in you this is you're a completely different guy than i knew before and he told him like man jesus has uh, changed my life and i want you uh to know this guy there's a chi alpha where you're going to be going to texas state uh in the next year uh how about you get plugged into them and they're going to tell you all about him so he uh came to us that way and he's been one of our most faithful guys he's never missed one of our we call them pods uh that's our small group uh He's been there every single time. He's just like a sponge. And over the past few months that I've been able to uh, be with him and tell him about Jesus Christ, he's accepted the Lord. He's gotten baptized in water, and he is now feeling called to uh, be in ministry full time. He doesn't know about changing his degree right now, uh, which is in athletics, something like that, but he's praying about that. Uh, but he feels that call, too, uh, that both Dane and I feel. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> That's just one of the amazing stories. There's so many students out there. I think I did a Google search <laughs> yesterday, and it said there are 15 million students on the college campus across the nation. And so Chi Alpha actually is a national organization um, sending out people to start these ministries on campus to minister to young adults and students. And so, yeah, there's just so many people we would want to continue to reach. Um, do we have any parents in the room here today? Okay, see, there's a lot of y'all, and that, that's the next generation, right? And what y'all are doing right now, like bringing your kids to church, I'm sure you, there's a lot of awesome kids in kids' church right now, and, and they're learning about Jesus. They're um, having just truth instilled in them and all these things. It's so important. I think it's in Proverbs where it talks about how you train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he won't depart from it. And so the things we're doing right now for kids, like, um, the way we lead our home, the way we bring them to church, teach them about Jesus, teach them scripture. These are all important things. But there's another side of it of when they do leave the home, right? Like Christian and I have been there. It's when we take that step and it's okay. I'm 18 years old and I'm going off to college. Who do I want to be? What type of life do I want to live? What do I want to believe? And it's there they get to make that choice. Like the college campus is I mean, you're picking a degree of what you want to do, but you're also choosing what do I want to believe. Um, and so, I mean, I was there, right? I didn't, I didn't know, and it was because someone loved on me and showed me, like, hey, there's, there's um, purpose to your life, and you have worth, and there's someone who loves you. And so that's why we just want to continue to minister to young adults, and uh, we feel the Lord calling us to Chi Alpha. And it's specifically for, I mean, there's so many stories on the college campus, right? Uh, for the, the girl that's alone in her dorm room and she doesn't know why her boyfriend's treating her that way. Or there's a guy sitting at the library and it's 3 a.m. and he's like, I'm just going to fail this chemistry test and my parents are going to hate me. Like, there's so, all these stories 
there's so many hurting, like lost students that don't know that there's more to life. Like it's not just about that test or your grade or that relationship that's hurting you. There is a God who loves you despite all of that. And he's going to meet you where you're at and lead you to freedom. And so that's just the heart we have to be on campus to be there full time. If they need us at 3 a.m. or 10 a.m. in the morning, we're there for them to be like, hey, we love you. Jesus loves you. And yeah, so that's the heart we have. And for us to be on the campus full time doing this ministry, there is um, a team that we need backing us up to do this. And we need this team backing us up two ways. The most important way is through prayer. Um, like Pastor Harry was saying, with every miracle, there's a mess, right? When uh, you are doing something the Lord's calling you to, the enemy's going to try to bring you down. And so prayer is so crucial for the college campus. Um, for Christian and I going and being there, but also just for every single student, for their hearts to be softened, for their minds to be open to Jesus, right? Um, so prayer is so important. And then the second way, um, we need a support team backing us financially to be on the campus 24-7. And so, yeah, right now we're in the process of building that support team. And I think they're going to show like a QR code on the slide, but if that's something you guys wanted to scan and learn more information about that, we are currently building that support team. And right now we're looking for families and individuals to join our support team at um, $100 a month or whatever the Lord places on your heart and your budget allows. And so that's why we just wanted to share our vision of Chi Alpha, what it's doing on the college campus and how you guys can be a part of that vision. So for all the students that just want to know the Lord, that's, that's our heart. And we want to share that with y'all. So thank y'all for having us here today, for hearing us out. And if it's okay, Pastor Harry, um, Christian wanted to pray over our talk. Okay, so Christian's going to pray. Yeah. All right, let's all bow our heads. Father, we're so grateful for all that you're doing in all of our lives, individually and collectively, Father. You're calling us to do so many things for your kingdom, and we're so blessed to have that privilege, Father. You don't need us, but you're calling us, and you're asking us to be a part of your story, Father. You're asking us to minister to students, Father, um, in many capacities, Father. But for us, me and Dayton, we feel that is the young adults on the college campuses, specifically Texas State, and where we're going to go and do this um, uh, CMIT program, which is UNT, and then come back and be on Texas State full-time, Father. Uh, we thank you for the students that you have in store for uh, us to meet and bring into a relationship with you, Jesus. This is all for you and because of you, Father. And we thank you uh, for... Uh, yeah, we just love you. Uh, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Now, you guys are going on the training um, when? Uh, July. In July. So you're going up to Dallas for a nine-month training? Ten-month. Ten-month, okay. It's kind of like having a baby. There you go. Uh Birthing a ministry, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And then you're getting married in June, right? July. Oh, July 1st, okay. So, yeah, so, yeah. Excited about that. Christian, Christian, for those of you that don't know, he's been a part of our church since the beginning. He's grown up here, and so we're excited to see you stepping into ministry and what God's called you to do. And we want to support uh, both of you guys. And um, so we wanted to have them come up and just give you all a chance to support them. Um, monthly um, to because basically they're not going to be working while they are in Dallas doing this training so the next 10 months especially um, they, they need to raise money how much have you guys raised so far right now our official number is $1,030 out of 3000 okay $1,030 so far monthly of monthly commitments 1030 every month so they, they need 3000 in monthly commitments in the next like two months so uh, so so whatever you can do uh, what you do is it is it's through assemblies of God and um, and so uh, what the, the QR code will take you to I think it's an assembly of God website uh, you give to assembly of God and assembly of God will make sure it goes to that account number and that's that's how it works so it's tax deductible um, and then and then it just goes to help pay for their living expenses so yeah Thank you guys for coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you go. Um, they do have a table in the back. If you have any questions, uh, we're going to dismiss right now. And uh, you guys can go back to the table and ask Dayton and Christian whatever questions you have.
Uh, you're dismissed. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks for joining us from home. God bless you.